and interested here for a little bit talking about location-based marketing. Um, I've got with me Per Ludicky from Spotzot and James Yancey from Cloud Tags. Uh, and then Greg McAllister from Pushpoint uh, was going to join us, but I haven't seen Greg today, so we're going to, as they say, crack on with, uh, with the two panelists that we have. So gentlemen, if you want to come on up. All right, so uh, we're just going to take a few minutes and, uh, and have these guys introduce themselves and talk just a little bit about their company uh, and their solutions and, uh, you know, kind of their approach to this important part of the ecosystem that isn't strictly about payments, but it's more about generating business. Um, so we'll start uh, pair with Spotsot. Why don't you give us a little intro, please? Great. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Per Lickey. I run a company called Spotsot. We are based in San Francisco. Um, what we do is enable brands and retailers to drive in-store sales and traffic through the phone. Um, our business strategy is we're a platform, not an app. Um, so we actually go out and through about 50 different um, publisher partners, Groupon, uh, eBay, a bunch of um, sort of uh, shopping focused applications, we work with them to drive uh, in-store sales through our own offers. So if you're going by a JCPenney's or a Barnes & Noble across the street here and have any of our app um, partner applications open, we will send you relevant, targeted, location-based offers uh, that through those apps, you can go into the store and actually scan um, the offer through the POS system and uh, the user gets a, um, uh, a discount. Um, sort of the broader picture for us is we're really helping uh, retailers in particular help fight against Amazon because really the only sustainable advantage we believe that um, retailers have over sort of the medium to long-term against Amazon is their in-store footprint, which ironically is actually sort of the downfall uh, as well. Um, we're about 30 people, about half in San Francisco, half in India, and we've been around for uh, about four years. All right, thank you, Perry. James? I'm James Yancey, I'm founder and CEO of Cloud Tags. Um, we took a slightly different perspective. We started the company a couple of years ago um, addressing the problem statement that Although you have all these technologies out there and all these apps and all these things to do for customers, uh, inside the walls of the physical store, very few to no customers actually do them in terms of scanning barcodes, using their phones to get product information, et cetera. So although in-commerce has been growing outside of the store, inside the store, it's definitely a very different scenario. So we kind of looked at the problem. We said it's really a customer behavior problem. Um, and, and we basically said, well, why, are, why is no one using apps inside the store the brand provides? And we started to look at it and we said, well, we know a lot of things to be true on the web about how you treat a customer. You have no barriers to entry to your website. You make the content amazing, really easy to use. And then if the customer likes you on the website, they'll buy a product, they'll opt in, et cetera. If you think about uh, mobile experience inside the physical store, it's the opposite of every one of those scenarios I just gave, which is you come in the physical store, you want to shop, you're distracted by a sign that says download our mobile app. If you do it and you use the free Wi-Fi and it works, um, oftentimes when you do finally scan that barcode, it's usually the worst content in retail, which is a product page of the product that you have in your hand. It tells you the price, which you can see on the price tag. And so we basically said, you know, we need to replicate um, how we treat customers on the web. And we started actually providing customers with mobile tablets the retailer provides as they walk into the store to have an experience. So imagine, you know, walking into Saks, for example, and, you know, the customers through different sections of the store can simply take a device. They don't have to tell you who they are in advance. They pick up the tablet and start to walk around. We use NFC to tap visual symbols throughout the store. So instead of scanning barcodes or QR codes, you simply touch and tap as a luxury experience. Uh, we use beacons that trigger content as you walk around the store. 
And uh, if you want to opt in at the end because you've created a collection of data that you've uh, made in the store, you put in your email and you get an email collection of everything that you saw in the store. Uh, we get 30 to 40 percent of customers in our stores to actually do the experience. If you have a mobile app and you're a retailer and you're honest, uh, you'll know that it's probably under 1% of your customers in your store using your brand app inside the four walls. Uh, about half of those people who do our experience sign up for email at the end voluntarily, and all that involves no coupon or discount. So we, we do all the analytics, the customer experience, the content creation for those experiences. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got two uh, fairly uh, different perspectives here on on uh, how to approach the, the customer. And, and one thing that, uh, James, that you touched on, um, and that is, you know, opting in. What are the opt-in strategies? You know, it sounds as though you're more focused on opting in at the end when the customer is ready to make the purchase, and, and Perry, you're more looking at having that customer drawing them to the store. They're already opted into the program. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, Per, why don't you start, talk about the differences uh, and the benefits and maybe some of the challenges that merchants are facing mm -hmm. with getting their consumers to opt in? Sure. Um, so uh, because we're a platform, not an app, we actually rely primarily on, the, on our apps to uh, manage the consumer experience. So if you're a, a lot of you probably have the Groupon app, um, and you get lots of deals probably pushed to you uh, every day um, from Groupon. So it's, we, are very, we don't actually control the ultimate consumer experience. Um, we, uh, our, our apps do, our app partners do. Um, but you know, most people, when they sign up for an app, um, uh, enable location sharing. It's a sort of a default mechanism. And they actually, I mean, from our experience, Consumers are opting in because they actually get something out of it. So it's this very easy, um, I think, facile sort of trade of, of rewards or benefits. Retailers get to know where consumers are, and retailers actually, and the consumers get to, um, you know, uh, get a deal or a discount or a better in-store experience, whatever it might be, um, from that. And I think, you know, a couple of years ago when there was all of the controversy about, you know, sort of Facebook privacy and Facebook sharing, um, you know, Zuckerberg and his team did a great job of actually sort of convincing the world that privacy is a thing of the past and you opt in and you get something out of it, you get a reward for um, uh, sort of sharing a lot of information and we're now reaping a lot of the benefits and our partners are reaping a lot of benefits and the retailers are reaping a lot of benefits um, so for sort of the, the uh, less or I guess the decreased emphasis or concern around privacy um, right now. James? Yeah, I think the opt-in piece is, is hugely important. I think, you know, as we looked at MAC address tracking, you know, it's becoming popular a couple of years ago, that's really when the consideration of, like, what is the, the cost and the benefit of what you can track on a customer and what's worth in terms of your relationship with your customer. Um, so, so basically, opting in at the end and making it optional, I think, is critical. I think when, when you ask for all their information up front, say, give me all your personal details, and then the reality is you give them a lackluster in-store experience or in-store content, like you wouldn't do that anywhere else. Like you wouldn't do that at your cash register, you wouldn't do that on your website. So I always find it very funny when we talk about mobile being the future of retail and how it's gonna change everything. And it's the one area of the business where you treat your customer completely different than the other area. So I think, I think being able to be anonymous in the store if you choose to and still have an amazing digital experience is really, really important. And making the opt-in piece participatory, open, transparent, uh, just like you would do with any other aspect of your business. Again, it's just the only, it's the only area where you would treat a customer different. And for some reason, we've become accustomed and lazy with the fact that we'll ask all this information from a customer through an app and oftentimes don't give them something in exchange. So I think opt-in is hugely important. Okay, thank you. Um, an important part, I think, you know, we, we can't look at these things as all independent pieces uh, in terms of marketing, uh, checkout, all those experiences, and loyalty, I think, is a big part of it as well. Um, anonymity is good, and, and some people do want, you know, to have that when they're just looking. Um, for some of us that are older, that's the classic, the clerk comes up and harasses you. Well, you know, are these, notifications that we may be receiving, you know, the push notifications you may receive in the store, are those today's clerk coming up, tapping you on the shoulder, or hovering around you saying, you know, can I help you? 
You guys have any thoughts on that? I, I, I guess simply for me, the consumer can vote to leave the store. I mean, it's not like they're, you know, j just like a, a sort of annoying clerk or somebody at the used car dealership coming in sort of pestering you about when you're going to buy. You can turn the notifications off, you can leave the store, and you can never come back again. Um, I mean, so, and that's a losing long-term proposition for the retailer, obviously, because loyalty, in-store retail loyalty is, I mean, I don't know if, from your experience, but it's, at least from my personal standpoint, it's pretty low right now. Um, you have to do a lot to get me in the store because I can usually find things cheaper and get them as fast or faster sometimes, um, uh, you know, online. So I guess the opt-in strategy says that the weight uh, sort of seems to, um, the argument framed as it is now seems to imply that the consumer is not in control. It's all from a, either an app or a sort of an advertiser or a publisher standpoint, but ultimately the consumer is in control. And if you don't frame the, frame the experience and deliver something of quality, as James talked about, the consumer is going to vote, and they're going to vote quickly, and they're never going to come to your store again or visit your app again. Yeah, we've, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, we found that just with a slight nuance of actually providing the device to the customer and allowing them to remain anonymous uh, gets many more customers to try these novel experiences. So I think, you know, I wasn't here for all the sessions this morning, but I think there's quite a bit of talk about, you know, you have to be very careful. You don't be first to test a beacon experience. You're going to offend your customers. They're going to walk out. I think that's all assuming that every single one of them has to bring the experience to their own personal environment on their own device. Um, which we encourage, and we encourage mobile app download, but a way to get a much higher percentage to start to do these experiences is to put the device in their hand, have everything previously set up so that we don't have to download anything, don't have to set anything up. And what we find is that, you know, even customers in very atypical demographics, older, more affluent customers, et cetera, love getting beacon interactions on a device the store provides and love tapping NFC tags, but if you did the exact same thing on their personal device and their personal space, and they had to go through the work of doing it, uh, then you do run the risk of offending them or you know, potentially using them as a customer. So I think, um, I think it's not just a question of, you know, can you use beacons to push interactions to a customer? I think it's, it's how you do it and you know, what you're giving them and what you're, they're getting in return. Um, I, I do think that there's probably, it's unfortunate there's so much you know, negativity or worry about losing the customer um, based on what we've heard. I think, again, depending on how you test things and the environment that you create, they can have a very positive experience and you don't risk losing them. So, and, and obviously it's a pretty innovative thing. So <clears throat> definitely a balance and definitely how you package it and what options you give them not to have to play uh, by, by your rules, I guess. Okay, James, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, do the mechanics of locating the customer matter? So NFC or you know, some other methodology of knowing that the customer is in the store, do the mechanics really matter? Yeah, I think, again, not to, to harp on the same things again, but coming back to MAC address tracking earlier, um, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's basically the ability to track an individual's phone. Was similar, it's kind of like what you'd have with a cookie ID online where you know, your phone as it connects to the router in the store for Wi-Fi uh, has an ID. So anything that's anonymous, uh, again, you really run the risk of, you know, the customer finding out. Because the difference is you're not tracking them with video. I think if you think about video, video, you still can track where the customer walks. It's more expensive. You have to have cameras throughout your store, granted. Uh, but you can get the exact same data you would get from AC address tracking in your store and do it by video. No, no invasive element for the customer. They've accepted the fact there's cameras in the store. Um, you can get the exact same data on a much smaller percentage of customers tracking MAC addresses on their phone and risk you know, nightmares like we saw with Nordstrom a couple years ago. Um, so I think, I think for tracking movements around the store, I think it definitely, you know, you should consider all your options, whether you, know, you want to do MAC or video, et cetera. Um, with beacons and tracking location, uh, the difference would be typically that you've had an app on your phone, so you've decided to download the, the retailer's app to use beacons for location tracking. MAC address tracking, you don't, right? So again, still tracking movements and, and using different types of sensors in the store. One is without your permission and without your awareness, which is MAC address tracking. Beacons, at least you've had to download an app on your phone for that locationing to, to work. Um, but again, I still think that even if they have the beacons on their phone, 
they should know and they should get benefit out of you tracking them. One of the things we do is we actually will show them areas they visited in the store and things around them in those areas they may or may not have seen. And so they know you're tracking them because you're giving them value and you're also getting value for the, for the brand. So we try to find ways where a customer gets value, the brand gets value, it's always transparent. So I think, I think it matters in that sense for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess the probably the big difference between maybe how we, the two of us think about it is is James is focused on well I'm speaking for you but like act, it, sort of in store activity once you're in the store yeah. that's where you're reaching the people. Yeah. Our goal is to get people in the store and let the merchants sort of broadly defined um, or the merchandising experience sort of convert people. Um, so for us the 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 discussion or the um, trade offs around. Uh, location tracking are really around the integrity and accuracy of it. So can we, you know, we don't need to be as accurate to the, you know, I don't know, to the square foot level as you do. We just need to make sure that we are getting sort of good lat long data and have the right store database so we can sort of um, do the lookup of where a consumer is at a certain time, uh, where a nearby store is at a certain time, and what the best offer is for that um, uh is 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 for that consumer. So beacons and you know all this sort of various technologies are part of our um, strategy, but they're not. It's not essential that we sort of pick one um, because our accuracy threshold is a little bit lower than you know Shopkick and and Cloud Tags and our people who are doing more like in-store stuff. All right. So um, you know large retailers, large chains, you know they certainly have the the wherewithal to put together you know very complex programs. You know, what about smaller, medium size uh, merchants? I mean, mm -hmm. does this scale down to the level that a, a single uh, brick and mortar uh, entity could use these type of techniques? And what sort of benefit is it going to bring to their business? You want to take that? Sure, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the answer is we do work with smaller brands. Uh, we work with Drop Dead in the UK that has uh, two two store locations. We work with larger brands, you know, like American Signature and others here in the states um, that have you know, hundreds of stores. I think what's interesting is um, the common theme, regardless if you're a big brand, which will leave a lot of them nameless for the panel, or you're a smaller brand is that they all have the same problem. Uh, you go in and you talk to the marketing people and they all say, you know, we want omni-channel seamless customer experience. And, and then as soon as they make any movement to do that, the first thing they do is walk in the door of the IT department uh, where they're quickly told 10 reasons why it's gonna take three years and cost you know, $20 million to do the project. And then they go back to their office and you know, draw on the whiteboard again. So um, I, think, I think the critical thing is getting out of that impasse where everything has to you know, be a three-year project and cost $20 million. Um, so regardless of your smaller retailer that's on you know, the Magento platform or if you're running Oracle or SAP, politically and otherwise, um, the challenges are really similar. So we work really hard to start with very simplistic basic tests in a single store location initially to prove out that customers will want to do an experience. Uh, and then once we prove that to be true, it gives them ammunition and data to go back to the tech team and the CEO and other people to get budget to make changes. So I think, you know, just as much I was talking around, around negativity, around testing beacons and things, because maybe the packaging hasn't been thought through in terms of how you want to give it to the customer, um, I would say, you know, regardless of a small store or large store, what we all need to work really hard at is doing very small controlled tests that are low cost and basic that prove out general customer behavior that can scale up. I think if we're all going to work hard to innovate customer experience, that's probably the A number one challenge right now. Because everyone I meet with, everyone I meet with, I don't meet with a single brand that's like, yeah, no, we're not really interested in having a seamless customer experience or doing an omni-channel, right? They all want to do it, every single one of them. And probably 90% of them won't and 10% of them will. And the only difference really is the ones who can get approval and start basic and scale up versus those who have to wait on a five-year project from SAP or Oracle or somebody else. Yeah, I, I think that's very accurate. The, the interesting thing about working with retailers is that everybody wants a test. So therefore, they, uh, even the largest retailer could actually look in the implementation of a program like a very, very, very small retailer testing five stores, testing 20 stores, testing 100 stores, what, you know, whatever the number is. So they basically end up looking like, um, 
you know, small to medium-sized retailers in the test, and you have to you have to prove the metrics on a very small scale in order in order to in order to sort of grow to the entire uh, store footprint. I think, you know, one thing that could be interesting about this, you know, who wins in like location sort of based uh, technology or what uh, retailers particularly take advantage of it. There could be a, like a U-shaped curve of, of effectiveness here. My theory or one hypothesis going forward is like the really small guys, one, two, five stores or even a single store may ultimately just use Yelp or use Square or use Groupon or something like that as their sort of core of their, of their um, location-based program. You know, the huge large retailers, they've got um, you know, companies like us and, and Shopkick and, and uh, you know, and others to sort of um, build out these very, very compelling programs. But what about somebody who's like 100 stores who, you know, runs into these IT challenges mm -hmm. where they start with five and then they go to 10, it's all great, but then moving into 100 is, you know, gets really challenging and they may not have the budget for it. So uh, it's sort of similar to how retail has panned out over the last 30 years is, you know, the, there's the advantages go to the real low cost guys and the really sort of expensive guys, Walmart and even Marcus, if you look at sort of value creation um, in retail over the last 30 years, same thing could actually happen in location-based technology. Okay. James, I'm glad to hear that uh, inflation has hit the, the development side as well. The stock answer I always got was 18 months and $10 million. Yeah, so. okay, there you go. Um, I want to open it up to the audience for questions. So, yes, sir? Yeah, so, so basically right now, it's, it's not meant to be mobile POS or checkout, right? So the idea is that it's a completely content-driven, creative experience for the customer to explore the store and curate. The, the problem statement the customer is trying to solve is, you know, I spent an hour in the store and I looked at 20 things and I bought nothing or I bought one thing. And now I go home and there was 19 other things I interacted with. On the website, it's very easy. You know, you can build wish lists and those types of things. Um, and the reality is that a lot of customers are taking their phones and taking pictures of price tags, or they kind of remember in their head it was a diesel gene, and they go back to the website and they realize there's actually 18 cuts and dyes and washes of that diesel gene, and they're not sure which one it was. So for the customer, it's curation. Um, now in terms of checkout, um, for the retailer, we'll also, it depends on the retailer, we'll do social integration, they can do coupons and discounts and things. So oftentimes, based on the experience, they'll get a code that's generated that can be then typed into the POS system that will then generate some sort of special checkout experience. But it's, uh, it's not meant to be checkout, it's really meant to be curation and data creation after you leave the store. So then you, you go home, you get an email, direct links, and other recommended products based on what you saw in the store. It's 50% it's generally opt-in at the end, and 30, 30 to 40%, depending on the segment that we work in, will actually pick up a device and start to walk around the store and experience it. And then on average, it's about half of them will put in their email at the end to receive their, their collection of what they saw in the store. Yeah. Yeah, so, and, and it's, you know, based on the time that we have, obviously, I'm not going through the, the entire solution, but our, our perspective and viewpoint is it's, <clears throat> it's not competing against apps. We definitely don't have the viewpoint that, like, apps are bad or apps are not the future. Apps are the future. I think our viewpoint is um, it's not working now to have customers use them in the store, so this is a nice bridge to change customer behavior today in a way that everyone can understand that's, that's transparent and opt-in. Uh, but we encourage them to download the app. So what we find is, especially for these segments, it's harder to get them to use. Like, the reality is there's kind of two things you can do that we've talked about. Either you have an audience that is 18 years old, and therefore you have to do nothing because they'll download the app and try things. Uh, or you have to pay your customers, right? So you have to give them a discount, whether it's discount for location, discount for downloading the app, discount for sharing something. Um, and again, all the stats I told you earlier is no coupon or discount. And so I think what we basically said is if you take a 50-year-old woman who typically wouldn't have downloaded an app and done a digital experience in the store, and you give her a device and the staff's working with her you know, to, to have the experience in the store, uh, we encourage them to download the mobile app to do the experience as well. And what we find, and, and we'll track this, is that if you can get them to do the experience in the store with the mobile device you provide, <clears throat> the chances of them then downloading the app and doing it on their own when they come back the next time are very high. So it's basically the tablets are a bridge strategy to get a much higher percentage of customers to get used to doing digital experience with the goal of transferring their behavior as, as it becomes more commonplace to, to apps. Yeah, I mean, our perfect, our perfect vision for the future of retail is basically uh, with 
with the Apple Pay coming out, or um, you know, it's based on NFC, but it's not open like Android. So today, in any of our clients we work with, you can walk in with your Android phone and you can tap any of our tags. It's a web-based app, and that's critical because for a web-based app, you're not having to download a native app on your phone and therefore not having to identify yourself. So our vision is that it's unlikely that customers are going to download a thousand apps for a thousand retailers and give all their personal details to a thousand retailers and use them in the store. You know, our, our version of the future is that especially as Apple opens up their NFC like Android, you could walk into any store, pull out your phone, tap visual tags in the store, get content, choose to identify yourself if you wanted to in that session, uh, but you're not, to your point, you're not continually identifying yourself and always giving the option for native apps but not making it mandatory. So, in you know, in a lot of ways, your model is, you know, try before you buy. And but once they've had the experience and, and you know they find that it's it's a positive experience, they opt in. You're really kind of flipping over to the more traditional model, um, similar to what Pear's been been talking about. Exactly. Is that accurate? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, the thing to realize is with a web-based app, although you can come in and have an anonymous experience and tap and get product information, you can never get a beacon-based location experience because at least for what we know today, because today to have a beacon base location experience, you need a native app. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, there's trade-offs for privacy versus personalization and location. Like what degree do you want to have those aspects in exchange for your personal data? So that kind of takes me back and, and you know, for both of you guys, what happens on the back end? How is it that you're using the information you capture once somebody's opted in to match the offers with uh, with the consumer mm -hmm. and on the next time I come in the store I've, I've used the tablet I've I've gone through that process I've downloaded the app the next time I come in the store you know how do you know uh, and what do you do to engage me the next time and the next time and the next time yeah um, what we do is we have device ID and we actually know every time somebody comes in and engages with one of our partner apps what their click patterns are, what categories they're clicking on, what stores they're in, um, what type of coupons, are, and should they come um, through, another, through another app or back to that app, we actually can um, sort of, you know, personalize the experience a little bit more. So if somebody has been interested in, you know, Macy's and is interested in Converse shoes, uh, next time they come and they're close to a Target or, you know, any store around here that might sell shoes or, or um, a sort of men's apparel, we actually can customize that experience more for them. And for ours, it's, it's similar to the experience you know today when you go to a website, right? So you choose to log in when you choose to log in, and you log out when you choose to log out. So we see the same thing in a store. So if you've gone to, uh, you know, to one of our retailers and you've built a collection on the tablet and you put your email in, et cetera, um, that data is being saved and stored. Um, if you come back a second time and you log in, uh, we also have the ability to integrate with back-end data from the retailers so that you can log in to the device and we can look at your browse history from the website. We can know if you have stuff in your wish list. We can know if you purchased stuff in the past. So that ideally, you know, uh, if you and I go shopping together and we both log into CloudTax devices in the store and walk around, um, if you've previously been browsing something and I've been browsing something different, as we both walk into shoes, uh, the content and the recommendations that we show on the screen will be related to the kind of shoes and things that you've been browsing online versus the kinds of products I've been browsing online. So the personalization is really just based on your, your past browse and purchase history data that we get from the retailer. Uh, but you sign in and sign out of the device, and then of course it's the same as we mentioned, if you download an app, then it is what it is, which is if you do open the app or you have it triggered by some sort of experience and it already knows who you are because it's a, it's a native app. Okay. Audience, more questions? Because I have one more. Okay. Um, the, question and that is, is, when, the question is, when are the martinis being served? I soon. Think. Very soon. Um, <laughs> earlier today, I was on a retail site, and I put a crib for my granddaughter in my shopping basket. I was logged in, so I'm authenticated. Now, I haven't purchased it yet, but if I walk in the store, and they happen to be using your platform, and I'm opted in, what's going to happen? Anything? Not with us, no. Sorry, and you said that you looked it on the website? I, or? I put it in my cart on the yeah. website. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if you logged in with a cloud tax device, uh, we would know the fact that you had that in your in your uh, in your basket. And two things would happen. One is when you got in proximity of that product, we would let you know that you were in proximity of something either you browsed or that you put in your your wish list, your basket. Uh, but two, because you actually put that in your cart, uh, we're going to go ahead and assume that you're likely to buy it. And therefore, as you walk around the store, we're going to show you recommendations that are related to that product that you're considering buying. So again, I have an anonymous customer. If you're shopping with me and I've never shopped with a brand before, I'm going to get generic information about the stuff that's around me, whereas you're going to get tailored information based on the stuff that's in your cart or your stroller. Okay. You're a very young-looking grandfather, though. Thank you. Bye. I have pictures. Um, yeah, Google came out with a, I'm not going to be able to quote it right here, and I don't want to um, quote the wrong number, but Google came out with a uh, sort of mobile to in-store shopping study three months ago, six months, a couple quarters ago maybe. Um, that actually showed sort of lift from mobile to in-store, meaning average basket size from somebody who sees an offer or, or um, a coupon on his or her phone and then goes into the store. And actually they had the basket size increases. Um, and you saw this effect sort of across all categories. Um, so I, I, it's, I, it's a Google report. I, I can, I'll send John the, the link and he can send it out to the, um, to the participants. But um, that's the only hard data that I've seen from sort of like a big, big, big brand. Our experience is the same, that we typically see you know, consumers trading up um, at basket size going up rather than you know, the more of, I think, the online experiences where you're at a checkout page, you go open a new tab, type in coupon for a crib, and then you know, sort of trade, uh, you're trading down, which is actually a very difficult margin for the, um, uh, for the retailer to handle. Um, so that's, that's the most authoritative data study I've seen. I don't know if Jim's Yeah, I mean, everything since, since day one that we've done has been sales driven. So it's never been about, you know, like nice, pretty tablets in the store. Um, there's six case studies on our website. On average, um, the lowest increase in average order value we've gotten from one of the experience is 15% increase in AOV. Uh, but we also show that the customers come back more frequently. Um, something to be mentioned is that the tablets that customers use in the store um, they're also assisted by the sales associates, and all the sales associates have NFC tags on their badges. So one of the big problems, and I'll, I'll explain to how this is related to AOV, one of the biggest problems that we find is that there's this disintermediation between the sales staff and these objectives for omnichannel experience, which is you're doing all these things where customers do the research in advance, they come to the store, they don't make the purchase in the store, but they spend 45 minutes with your sales associate, they sit on the sofa, they talk to them about it, and then they say, you have a website, right? Or you made the mobile app so good, they're just going to purchase the mobile app. And that's, that's the worst nightmare of every salesperson in retail today. And so we basically allow them to touch and tap the tablets with their, their badges in the store so that when they go and buy online later, we know not only that they can visit the store, but we know the sales associate helped them. Uh, and so that also encourages increase in average order value because it's getting the uh, sales associates very involved with the process with the customer instead of instead of making it an app driven thing where uh, you know they're they're terrified to see a kiosk or they're terrified that the new app came out because it just means less commission. So I think I think one of the big jobs that the, all of us have is to figure out the best middle ground. So the sales associate makes more because the store makes more because the customer is buying more, regardless if they buy in the store or if they buy digitally. Right. So. Okay. Um, one last question for me, and that's something you've both mentioned. And that's omni-channel. You know our is location-based marketing really today or part of a comprehensive omni-channel program or is it another silo that retailers have to contend with? Um, I think it's an essential piece of being omni-channel because omni-channel really means, uh, well, because the phone is actually omni-channel. I mean, the omni-channel right now is in the store at, or online and the phone is actually both. And you can't really do shopping on the phone effectively. It's our both our companies' strong perspective, I'd imagine that you know location is core to uh, uh, you know core to that. The you know the reality is, f despite 15 years of great innovation in e-commerce, online sales still represent seven percent of overall retail, and and the share is actually you know it's very it's a very 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 small share. Um, so along comes the phone, which has the personalization characteristics of the web, but sort of like the reality of being in the store where still all the transactions are done. 
And so I think location-based targeting is going to be essential, whether, you know, and the book is still being written on it, but um, it's, I think it's going to be an essential part of every retailer and brand uh, strategy going forward. Yeah, I think it's like a never-ending debate, right, of omni-channel is a real thing or if it's multi-channel done well. Um, my perspective is that omni-channel is distinctly different than multi-channel and that it's really about the customer not only having the seamless experience that we talk about, but it's also on their own terms, right? So it's not your terms, it's their terms, and that means whether or not they give you their data, whether they purchase on their device or your device, in the store, at home, on the go, et cetera. So I think location is a big part of that. Um, you know, if you believe that omnichannel is a thing and it's distinctly different from multi-channel, I think the biggest differentiator is is on the customer's terms. And I think location has to be a part of that. Uh, if you take location out of that equation, um, then it's really just multi-channel, I would argue. Uh, so I would say yes. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.